Hi, welcome to this edition of Digital Unplugged, how to enable enterprise digital transformation for your organization. My name is Ed Marks. I serve as the Chief Digital Officer for Tech Mahindra HCI, Health and Life Sciences. So glad to have you back with us. This is one of a multi-part series, and I'll get into that here in a second. This is live, and we do it live for two reasons. The main one is to interact with you. So while obviously this will be posted online for others to see later, for those of you in our live audience, if you have any questions, you know how to do this. You can ask questions. We typically get about uh, five to 10 questions each time, and we try to address all of them. So we will definitely go off script to make sure we're hitting those things that you're most interested in. So today's guest, so he's been a guest with me several times, is Patty. And Patty's also the co-author of our forthcoming book, which we've alluded to a couple times. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it today just because it's getting closer. So you can read about Patty. I think you all know him pretty well since he's been so such an integral part of these uh, Digital Unplugged series. So what I wanted to do is just to remind everyone, what is the definition of digital? If you listen to in the very first episode, we basically said, there's no standard definition. Find one that works for your organization so you have common language. So we gave each of our own and also the one out of the book. So that's what we have to say about digital definition. And then, as I mentioned, this is part of an ongoing series. The first time we met, we talked about the definitions. And then the second time we, thought, we talked about three key differentiators. And if you recall, it's all about the experience. So that's one thing you get from this series. Digital transformation is all about the experience of all of the types of customers that you might have. And then at the last time, we spoke about the model for digital transformation. So what is a model? So again, there's not a single perfect model. The important thing is that you have a model. So we introduced one for you and it's available for download and you can have. And it's also reflected in the book that's coming out. It was actually set to come out in June, but because of the pandemic, we actually took a month pause and added in some relevant information related to pandemic uh, because COVID-19 may not be the only one that we deal with in our lifetime. So we took a little bit of time to modify that. So the date looks like it will be August. We're very excited about the book uh, because we think it'll be really practical for all of us in healthcare in terms of digital transformation. So with that, let's go into today about part four. And part four is really about sort of the technical foundations. So in the book, we don't really spend a lot of time. It's not meant to be a technical book. Digital transformation is really about culture. It's about user experience. It's about change. It's about strategy. But that, with all that said, you have to have a strong foundation to stand up on. And so this book, while meant for C-suite level executives and others, we don't spend a lot of time on technology, but just enough uh, so that you have a good understanding so that you can move forward with your digital transformation. So with that, we're gonna kick right in. So Patty is with us by voice today. And so Patty, I wanna talk about sort of that foundation. Talk, can you talk about why it's important to have a, a strong foundation? And then we'll get into one of the, what are some of the components of the foundation that is sort of weak in healthcare that we really need to address? So, uh, hey Ed, and uh, thank you for having me on this uh, show once again. It's always a pleasure to come back and uh, be a part of these uh, discussions. I think what's happening today is that uh, we are seeing a dramatic increase in uh, the shift towards the virtual care models. And it's obviously brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is uh, creating a, a set of uh, needs for institutions that have not prepared themselves for this kind of a sudden shift. And that might expose some weaknesses in uh, their core IT infrastructure or just in their level of preparedness for uh, the change that is uh, that is upon us. Uh, but I think the overall there is good news, which is uh, based on everything that I see and hear, 
which is that most healthcare institutions have some kind of a program in place. And now that the immediate crisis is sort of behind us, at least in terms of being able to take care of people and have a virtual care model to uh, address uh, patient needs, now I think everybody is taking a step back and looking at the choices that they've made uh, under pressure and maybe review those choices and try to uh, uh, maybe look at the longer term in terms of what kind of decisions they need to make today. So we're in an interesting situation right now. Yeah, and I so that's definitely one thing. I think that the two other things that we're dealing with and COVID really exposed us, and this is not about COVID. There's plenty of great material and great webinars and podcasts on COVID. So even without the COVID influence, I think we saw, and we, we talk about it in the book, where historically there's been an underinvestment in sort of the foundational aspects of technology to enable digital transformation. And, and secondly, the whole concept of technical debt. Can you speak, Patty, a little bit about technical debt and, and what are some recommendations on how to eliminate that debt? Yeah, healthcare and health systems in particular have long uh, underinvested in information technology. And so, and we all know this, uh, we are we're not necessarily at the uh, bleeding edge of technology developments. We are cautious and for good reason. And over the years, uh, the cumulative effect of underinvestment in technology, whether it is at the infrastructure layer, whether it is uh, in terms of the proliferation of applications over time that don't necessarily talk well to each other, uh, whether it is in the networks that now all of a sudden have to transform in order to support a lot of the new digital health modalities, uh, the multi-channel communication uh, infrastructure that is being put in place to engage with patients and so on. That is in many ways exposing the need for investments in core infrastructure and applications to uh, bring them up to a point where they can effectively support the new digital health uh, paradigm. So that's what uh, is mostly referred to as technical debt today. And it's just, a, it's just a function of the cumulative effects of underinvestment over long periods of time that we're now coming to a reckoning with. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, as we look at sort of where health systems and hospitals are headed today, they, they're at this point where they have to do two things, eliminate costs and at the same time, you know, continue down that virtual care path that sort of suddenly got, uh, you know, as, as previous guests have said, you know, we went six years in, in advance and six weeks. And so you you have to really be bimodal. And you know if there's if there's a couple of key things that we've talked about so far, just to remind everyone when it comes to digital transformation, the first again is the experience. It's all about the correct design, the experience of our patients, our caregivers, and so forth. The second is to be be agile. And when we would mention agile again, let's just say last year, people kind of looked at us a, a little bit funny, but people were forced to not, you know, it's not necessarily agile, the fact that you stood something up very quick, uh, but agile is definitely a way of work. And we're going to talk about that a little bit towards the end of our time together today, because you have to be able to move quickly in this new world and at the same time address that infrastructure. So to be agile in this sense means you can do both. You can take care of technical debt, you can take care of some of the foundational technologies and do virtual care. It used to be that organizations got stuck because they looked and you know I talked we talked to a lot of CEOs and CFOs and they were like, wow, how can we afford to become digital or digitally transform when we have all this technical debt and we have all this poor foundation? And so they were thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to take three to five years, you know, millions and millions of dollars. But the but the truth is, especially when we, you know, the, one of the things that we share in the book and where we're headed is you can do both at the same time. You don't have to wait years. You don't have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. You can move forward in, with virtual care now and at the same time take steps to address the underinvestment and the technical debt. 
So that that's the good news, and, that, and that's kind of new news uh, to a lot of a lot of health systems. Although, again, as a result of what just happened with the pandemic, uh, people are certainly coming to that realization. So let's talk now about the technology a little bit. So what are some key areas of technology, Patty, that you would recommend investment in when it comes to uh, virtual uh, care, digital transformation? What are some of the things that we really need to sh make sure the foundations are there? Yeah, I think in, in light of where we are today, uh, I think there's two major components of digital transformation that uh, most health systems that I know are focusing on. And, and this is what I consider to be the high priority areas as well. The first one is obviously access. So as we know, because of the way virtual care has been forced upon us, the way to access care is also uh, is also changing and has changed. And uh, but then access is not as seamless as uh, we want it to be. So while we have a proliferation of virtual console tools and technologies and platforms and a number of digital health tools to you know help patients find care, schedule you know appointments and so on and so forth. It's still not a seamless experience. So I think the uh, uh, priority for uh, health systems needs to be to uh, not only put in place a virtual, uh, infra, you know, virtual care infrastructure that enables patients to access the care uh, at the time and place and uh, location of the, you know, of their choosing, but also to make it seamless. And so that is, I think, the immediate challenge in front of uh, health systems. So. Broadly speaking, I'd call it telehealth and digital front doors, uh, for want of a better term, and and that's what a lot of health systems are focusing on. But very closely related to that is also the aspect of care management, because we now have a lot of patients who are unable to come into the hospitals for a variety of reasons. They may be chronic uh, patients with chronic conditions, or they may just be patients who need routine care and they need to you know do their routine follow up visits or even simple, you know, preventative things like, you know, colonoscopy and whatnot. But all of that is now on hold. And uh, while some things for something, you still need to come into the hospital for a lot of things, you can still enable the, you know, preventative care and chronic condition management through remote care and remote monitoring tools. And I think that's the other focus area that uh, health systems uh, need to focus on in order to make sure that the populations remain healthy. So I would say those are the two broad areas. So access, in terms of telehealth and digital front doors and uh, care management through remote monitoring tools. Yeah, th those are good points. And I think, you know, behind that all, when we think about this from, again, this is as technical as we'll get in the in the book and any of our, our webinars, but it just has to be addressed, is you need to make sure you've got the, you know, the technology infrastructure, so the processing power. Um, you need to make sure that you have the networks. You know, when we were trying to digitally transform at my former organization, we we did a lot of research, and it's just the amount. You know, we were looking at quantum computing type of uh, processing power required to digitally transform research. Um, so it's it's really important that you address those foundational things. The other the other area is just networks, right? It, this seems pretty obvious, but in this day and age, when you're so used to turning on any app anywhere you have to think about your internal network. So with, within your own ecosystem, is your wireless network, is it robust enough to carry all this traffic that we're speaking about? And, you know, we were, we were a very innovative organization with very many creative capabilities. And we always had to make sure, first and foremost, is that as we were rolling some of these advanced capabilities out, whether it's like wayfinding or VR, AR capabilities as we digitally transform, that we had the robust enough network because the worst thing, right, going back to the experience would be to have really cool type apps and uh, capabilities, but then the foundation, the infrastructure is not there to support it and you have this terrible experience. And I always say you only get one, it's, you know, that first impression, you, you really only get one crack at this. And so you need to make sure that that is all ready to go as you uh, look at the virtual care, the more fun part, and, you know, the more experiential part, you have to still take care of this foundational piece. I think that's what we're trying to, to say. The, the last part before we move on to sort of the new ways of work is from a tech foundation point of view is all about uh, data. And some of this, you know, you, you get this content other places, but sometimes it gets separated from 
from you know digital transformation and it really shouldn't so i want to spend a moment or two i want to before i get into that question i want to remind everyone uh if you have any questions for patty or myself to address regarding digital transformation and kind of sort of some of the foundational elements uh please uh utilize the question bar and we will address those straight away so patty you know can you talk a little bit uh, you know from your point of view what you've seen with all the interviews you've done clients that you've worked with related to data you know and you, we can take this multiple ways and you can choose a uh, one or two but you know there's of course privacy and security uh data management interoperability and finally data governance you know what 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 are some things you're talking to c-suite here what are some things we you, they need to understand about you know data yeah i think the the single biggest priority seems to be to get uh a unified view of the consumer or the patient. And because the data about the patient is now sitting in different, uh, not only in different source systems within a typical healthcare environment, it could be sitting inside an EHR system, it could be sitting inside a CRM system, it could be sitting in other systems as well. But now you also see the proliferation of devices in the context of remote monitoring, which I just talked about. There's gotta be a way to integrate all of the data into one unified, uh, uh, source, if you will, and I don't want to call it a single source of truth because that might be too idealistic, but at least some kind of a data uh, management infrastructure where you're able to connect the dots and uh, uh, really understand your patient populations and their needs and be able to uh, serve up the kind of experiences that they're looking for from an access uh, management standpoint, but also in order to intervene in a timely way, whether it is uh, in a preventative uh, mode or whether it is to respond to uh, any kind of an emergency. So I think there is a big focus right now on trying to get a, as much of a unified view of the uh, consumer and make it as real time as possible. But with the data, it's always work in progress and there's no, uh, there's no end to it. And, but there is a certain minimum that you have to, I think, uh, accomplish in order for you to be effectively serving the needs of your patient populations. And that's what a lot of uh, executives are now uh, focusing on from my conversations. Yeah, I think another, well, here on, on a practical level, everyone should at least do an inventory of their organization and where all the data resides. Because I think everyone, I don't think anyone would be excluded. Everyone's going to be surprised because a lot of these data sources aren't even on your network. So don't think that you have them all covered because you probably don't. And so we really took a very strategic view of data and did in commission sort of the study where we get an inventory of all the data sources and to the best that we could we knew we were still missing some but we we cast the net and you really need to do that so again you can do some data discovery through you know network type tools but you really need to go out and visit with your with the primary areas that you think may be collecting data and sure enough we you know everyone has these sort of stories where you find the server underneath the the desk of someone who's doing some some research and not, and then, you know, in tying that back to privacy and security, the, the worst thing that could happen, that person carries unwillingly, you know, unknowingly, innocently carries that data somewhere, loses it. You read stories about that all the time. Uh, that's that that breaks a promise that we've made to our patients that we would hold their data uh, very, uh, that we wouldn't share, let it go to, to anyone. So this, so it's really critical to do the inventory for that reason. And the other reason is like you were saying, Patty, it's like, there, there's a lot of richness in all that data and it and you need all the different pieces of that data to make good decisions on behalf of that patient. So, you know, as we go into digital transformation and, and apply artificial intelligence and machine learning, having rich data sets that, that come from a variety of sources within your hospital and health system is really key. So again, practical, you know, do that inventory, find out, and then you have to set up data governance. And that's another tough thing because especially if you're a complex organization. If you're not a complex organization, even then it's tough. But you need to have very rigorous and robust data governance because if you don't, again, the, you're, you're putting your organization and your patient's information at risk. And then you want to be able to make good decisions. And the final thing, Patty, I would say about data is that a, a, many organizations are looking to commoditize a data. Uh, they see it as an additional source of revenue. It is rich data and looking at ways of de-identifying that data and then using it for the public good. And so that's another thing that, that a lot of organizations are thinking about. Some are doing it already. 
there's a lot of hunger for the richness of that data. And again, uh, I think if done correctly, if done safely, uh, it's it's for the it can be for the public good. So that's another thing that uh, some organizations are doing uh, related to. Yeah, yeah, if I may just jump in with one comment. Yeah, the commoditization of data and the virtualization of data through uh, an API infrastructure that uh, you know that makes it easier to uh, access the data uh, you know underlying uh, the application without having to go through the you know through the machinations every single time. That is something that people are looking at as well. And this doesn't sound like digital transformation, but it's a it's an important enabler to digital transformation because it accelerates innovation. It improves developer productivity and it gives you a sort of an abstraction of the underlying data layer, which I think a lot of organizations are beginning to uh, realize benefits from. And, and by the way, healthcare is a little bit behind when it comes to API-led strategies when compared to other sectors like telecom or financial services and so on, where it's very, very commonplace. But I think there's a huge opportunity there for healthcare. Agreed. So we are live with Digital Unplugged, Part 4, Enabling Foundations. We are talking about those things that need to be in place in order for digital transformation to occur. Sometimes we'll want to jump ahead. we got to take care of some of the basics. But again, we're not saying that the basics first and then digital transformation. We're saying both. Bimodal, you can do both at the same time if carefully planned and executed. So we talked about, in the first few minutes, Patty, we spoke about you know kind of the history why it's so difficult for us to digitally transform in healthcare, some of the lack of prior investment, the technical debt. Then we talked about, okay, what are some key technology things that everyone should understand and make sure they're addressed, everything from processing power to networks. Spent a lot more time on data, given how important it is to transformation, as you, as you just mentioned. So in this last section, let's just talk about new ways of work related to enabling foundations because you so we would argue i would argue that you could have the right technology and let's just say you get the right investments and everything going you've erased the history you've improved upon things and you may still not achieve all your digital transformation goals if you don't change the way you fundamentally operate as an organization or to get practical for some of our audience as an it organization but we see it as an organization, the entire thing, uh, but you can, you depending if you're departmental specific as a as a listener, uh, you can apply it to yourself if you represent IT. So you have to operate in new ways. Uh, what what are your thoughts about that? What have you seen? And, and then we can get into some specific ways of. Yeah, of yeah I think ultimately, you know, uh, we, we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, it, it's a people business at the end of the day. So the technology is an enabler to people, uh, whether it's caregivers, uh, physicians, uh, administrators, to do their jobs better. And you know, because of the because of the pace at which uh, the change is occurring, especially in the shift towards virtual care, we have to make sure that uh, you know the, the folks who are entrusted with the technologies to work with the technologies are adequately prepared trained uh, to work with these technologies. So it's one thing to expect patients to download an app and you know log into a, let's say my chart or you know whatever and put in a query. But it's another thing to have a process in place where you make sure that the queries are responded to in a timely manner. And if you don't, then you're going to see the adoption rates drop off. And so the people aspect of it and the process aspect of it becomes very, very important. So that's one thing I'd mention. The other thing is there's new needs that, that are going to emerge as a result, uh, unfortunately, of the pandemic. And one of those things is, uh, you know, there's going to be a need for more and more contactless uh, uh, te technology. So when people do come back into the hospital, they're not going to want to touch any surface and you don't want them touching any surface either. So how do you, you know, reorganize your uh, processes and reorganize your uh, operations in a way that you're able to minimize uh, contact, uh, at least in some aspects, such as you know registration and check-in and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, at the back end of it, uh, you're investing in con you know contact tracing and those kinds of technologies. These are all new. This is all new territory. Uh, you know, people have to become comfortable with it, and organizations have to invest in making sure that they're adequately trained. The processes are clearly laid out, and uh, expectations are, are properly laid out. So I think that is the challenging part. The tech is easy, but you know, 
the driving adoption rates, making sure it works for everyone and not just one group of individuals. All of those, I think, are big challenges. Yeah, I think some of our colleagues, you know, some of the best, uh, who I think are the best CIOs in the in the world out of NYP and Intermountain, I, I forget the exact percentage, but they they talk about that as, you know, the tech being 10%, and uh, but it all comes down, the rest of it's really, the bulk of it's really the people. Um, right. So in the last couple sec minutes, I want to be really super practical. We don't have a lot of time to get into the detail, but maybe enough to whet people's appetite. You can research it on your own and, and uh, so forth. But one thing that we've seen digitally transform companies, and again, the first one, I, the first idea I'm going to pitch out there, and I'll just talk about really quick and, and then we'll be wrapping up, but is IT service management. So that's sort of the best practice. So for how to operate IT across all industries. So we talk a lot about best practices on the clinical side, and you would not want to go to a clinician that wasn't following best practice. So why would we want people dependent on IT if IT is not following best practice? And is best practice what you invented yourself? It might be, uh, but if you don't have that level of confidence that it is, I'm a big believer in ITSM and I could tell stories. I implemented ITSM uh, at three different organizations and the uh, improvement, and we actually uh, published the statistics. So the, the improvement was hockey stick improvement uh, in terms of the reduction of errors, uh, which ultimately uh, helps in the entire care ecosystem, helps save lives, helps improve quality of life, better caregiver experiences. It touches on everything that's important to us. Um, so if you don't have a best practice, I would adopt one and I like ITSM just because you can measure it, you can certify it. And we went to the extent in, in my past that everyone in IT was ITSM certified, including assistants. So we wanted everyone to have that common language. That's one thing, very practical. And another is uh, agile. We mentioned agile at the top. You know, every modern company today, uh, like Facebook or Instagram or Spotify, the one reason for their success is there agile companies? I mean, the entire organization is agile. So I was first exposed to agile when I was at Texas Health about uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we were using agile in parts of our organization. And then New York City was the same thing. We were using agile in parts of our organization. And then in my last organization was the first time we brought it all together. Every part of IT was agile, certified agile um, and ITSM. And it just made a difference in, in customer service, how quickly we could turn things. And so when something like a pandemic comes up, you're ready. It's already the way that you work. It's already the way that you think. It's, it's embedded in the culture. And so it's a lot easier to turn and pivot and meet customers' needs, roll things out. Again, what I don't want to do, we're not doing an infomercial here for ITSM or Agile, but those are two leading new ways of work that can really help you. So when we talk about, again, enabling foundations for digital transformation, all these different things that we spoke about today are, are really critical. Patty, did you, do you have any final comments on one of these new ways of work or, or any final comments in general as we're down to our last uh, minute? Well, I think I, you know we've covered a fair amount of ground here. I, I think Agile is probably going to be extremely important. And uh, you, know, you can define Agile in different ways depending on the context and you don't have to go through a full-blown agile every time you do a project or every time you you know launch something new because in in an era of uh, rapid innovation you have to adopt the model that works best for you so if there's an agile light for instance that works for you go for it but you know but stick to the you know the the, the spirit of agile which is you know, not to take too long you know work incrementally and build on successes uh, no matter how small they are that's that's really the mantra in today's context patty thanks so much for joining me again and i thank our audience for joining me i think we might have one uh, slide on sort of upcoming uh live webinars we have some uh great guests coming up in the future uh dr matt lambert he's a practicing physician and someone i've worked with extensively virtual care and our next digital transformation will be with suja who's the CDO, Chief Digital Officer for Common Spirit. So thank you everyone for joining us again. Thank you, Patty, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Ed, real pleasure.